everybody, and welcome to an all-new podcast series. I'm taking a little experiment here, and I want to talk about hotel history a little bit. Every single week, I'm hoping to get this done, because why? There are so many great hotels out there that are just steeped in history and culture. I know all of you listening right now can think right now about those great hotel memories you had at some of the grand dames that are out there, and some of the places that you grew up with in part of your neighborhoods and part of your childhood, and you look back on them and go, wow, want to know a little bit more about that history of that property. So found a little bit of an opportunity here to do this sort of thing. And I thought it'd be fun to start off with a property called the Georgian Terrace Hotel, which was originally constructed in 1910 and 1911 and first opened to the public in 1911. But I wanted to do this show because I had a chance to stay there and it really mixed the sense of the modern with the historic in a great package. So I brought on board Mr. Uh, Mark Williams, who runs the hotel for the management company Chesapeake Hospitality, which is owned by Southerly Hotels. I know a little confusing there. And the hotel historian, Mr. Trevor Hollis, who's put in about eight years or so in two different stints, the most recent one being the last three years. Gentlemen, welcome to the Hotel History No Vacancy podcast. How are you guys? We're doing great. Great to, great to be here. So this is exciting to me. I, this, this is the first time we're doing this. I love Atlanta. I love the history of Atlanta. And I'll tell you what, you guys had your city burned at one time, so we don't get things necessarily as super old as the hotel that you have at the Georgian Terrace, which we said was uh, created from 1910, 1911. What's it like working over the Georgian Terrace? Maybe we could start by you guys sharing a little bit about what the experience is like now. Well, I'll kind of start with yes, know, from my from my point of view uh, from managing. You know, it's it's as a general manager uh, or a managing director or whatever you call them. It, it's really um, when you're coming through the ranks. There's there's you know different types of hotels. There's airport hotels, convention hotels. There's historic hotels, center center city, you know resorts. And I've done all of those. Yeah. Um, the, the great thing about it is when you really think about your dream job as a general manager and what you would envision, the type of service you want to provide and, and the type of building and, and the amenities, this hotel's got it all. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you walk in here as a GM and you're like, wow, this is what you really always wanted. Right. And to be able to have that experience and to be able to, to even create a team to provide what, you know, we vision that we want to provide as far as service and, and putting the hotel on the map as far as where we want to put it. Um, it it's been a great experience so far. Um, you know, Chesapeake allows me to – really gives me carte blanche and allows me to be uh, very entrepreneurial in managing the property, which is pretty unique for GMs. Usually you've got people hanging over you and reporting and – you know, they call you once a week or how, you know, they leave me alone. They let me, they let me manage the hotel as if it's my business. And, and it's really a, a business of caring and really feeling like we're caretakers of this property. Uh, yeah, that's the sense that I got when I, when I enjoyed my stay there. It was only one night, but I wished it was a, a lot more. Fortunately, I'll be coming back down there in September of this year to enjoy the hotel again. But while I was awesome. there, I had the chance to bump into uh to, to you, sir, Trevor, you uh, you got to share a lot about the hotel, and you, you know what? You're really the inspiration for why I wanted to uh, start talking to you guys today. Maybe you could – let's get into some of this uh, hotel history right now. Um, they built the hotel in 1910-11. What's happened since then? Well, um, there were several things, especially with the Georgian Terrace, with the great history that we have here at our hotel. Um, some, a couple of things that uh, – Probably I didn't uh, share with you. Well, share it. Um, let's pretend you've shared nothing with me so the audience can learn every single thing because there's so many great <laughs> well, stories. I got, I got quite a bit to say then. Good. This hotel, I'll just shut up and let you talk for the next four hours. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> this hotel has such great history. One of the ballrooms that I did not get to take you into was our, um, our grand ballroom, which in the 20s um, just uh, at – People did not know this was um, also Arthur Murray's first dance studio. This is where he started uh, his practice with all of his dance studios, which is legendary all around the world. Right. Um, also, that was the 20s. Just a few things. Um, in the 70s, it was also called the Angora Ballroom, which also um, we call it the Electric Ballroom, which uh, start most of the artists that would come here into the South to start their albums, um, just a few names to, to say out there was Kiss, um, U2. Um, they all started uh, in the 
uh, luxurious, what we call Georgia's um, Grand Ballroom, but it was also called the Angora Ballroom and the Electric Ballroom. Now, during that time period, I suspect that the hotel was not as high quality experience at the same time? Well, yes. Um, it, it, and they, they closed the doors in 81 uh, for the hotel. Uh, the hotel had a few, um, what would you say, vagrants, right? By the, yeah, and they cut, and also undesirable, uh, uh, right. undesirable, and it also caught on. It had a couple of fires back then, but uh, it, it was supposed to close in '86 mm -hmm. um, until um, until it became a historical um, preservation, and that stopped the the the. Um, that stopped the closing of the hotel. Right. That was really driven by uh, really the Save the Fox uh, movement. The Fox Theater is directly across right. from us. Um, and, uh, you know, that whole grassroots movement really started in the early 80s. Because Midtown Atlanta, which is completely different from what you saw, Glenn, when you were here back yes, then. Mm -hmm. And I actually spent some time here in the mid-90s because uh, I was in the music industry back then for a little while. Um, you didn't come down to Midtown back in the 80s. You know, the late 70s, the 80s, and really the early 90s. It was really rough. Um, and the hotel had been closed uh, really from 81, almost to 91, uh, when they added the tower back in 91 and reopened it as an apartment complex. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but then uh, a few years later, it converted back to a hotel, which is the state you see it in now. Um, as far as the structure is concerned, obviously it's yes, been through a couple of different owners and renovations, but... Uh, yeah, it's gone through a lot of uh, incantations, as they say, or incarnations at the hotel, uh, as you would say. Just it, it's had a ton of history, and even I'm sure that uh, Trevor had mentioned to you too. You know, from you know coming back to 1911 and the 20s with the Arthur Murray Dance Studio, and yep. then in 1939 we hosted the Gone with the Wind Gala. Uh, you know, Margaret Mitchell dancing on tables. You know, all that type of stuff. That's a that's amazing. So, uh, you, yes, you actually hold, held the party for the world premiere showing of Gone with the Wind, which when um, Factoring in Inflation is the most successful movie of all time. Yes, better than Avatar and better than the the, uh, the Force Awakens. That's how impactful it was. So you had Clark Gable, Carol Lombard, Vivian Lee, Lawrence Olivier, Olivia de Havilland, Claudette Colbert. Wow. Victor Fleming, Louis Mayer, basically all of Hollywood, the glitterati of Hollywood uh, came for this premiere party. Unbelievable. Yeah, they absolutely did. And, uh, you know, because it actually, the, the, the movie premiered at the Lowe's Theater, which is actually, was, was downtown Atlanta at that time. So this was really, you know, it's, only, it's probably about a mile, maybe a 1.2 miles to where the theater used to stand. But, you know, back in 39 in that area, this was on the outskirts of town. Right. You know, this was a little bit out, and this hotel was known as, you know, the Grand Dom of Atlanta, and everybody wanted to be here, but it was, like, set on the edge of town, so it was a little bit away, so they could really kick back and have a really good time. Um, you know, they used the carriage entrance for a lot of the entrances, and they brought everybody into the basement, through the old Italian restaurant, up into the ballroom, just a big party. We actually have a couple of pictures of Clark Gable and Olivia de Havilland coming up to the ballroom, standing in front of the doors. Um, pretty interesting stuff, though, but, I mean, it's, you know, and Margaret Mitchell, with her history here in town, you know, mm -hmm. she was kind of, uh, she was a rebel. I mean, she really was, and she liked to kick her heels up and have a good time, and uh, she got up on tables and danced with Clark Gable during the party, ah. and just, they were having a blast. It was crazy. Uh, that sounds like a lot of fun, and definitely a party uh, I would have liked to have been part of, but sometimes, <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, the Georgian Terrace was not home for uh, parties. Uh <laughs> the Solicitor General, Bert Donaldson, apparently was uh, the victim of a, a hit there from uh, Underworld Crime back in 1926. Is that right? Yeah. Trevor, you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I want to hear this story. You know, usually so, we get yeah, those good well, stories about, about it. Yeah, usually so, we get those stories for, like, steakhouses in New York City, but uh, I don't usually hear great stories like that about uh, Atlanta. Yeah, the setup was is that he had come to town and was uh, he was out prosecuting and, and really making a big move on a lot of the mob and a few other things. But he was down here doing it, thinking he could stay away uh -huh. from wherever he was, wherever his pressure was going. But obviously, he wasn't able to get away, so he actually got hit while he was here. Oh goodness! I... Yeah, a little crazy. Uh, yeah, so what, uh, so what happens, um, when something like that happens? Does he, does he actually get to pay his, did somebody pay his bill, or, you know, is they just... Uh, <laughs> I think the state ended up paying his bill. Yeah. I don't really have to, I 
don't really have all the ins and outs of it, but I'm pretty sure the state probably paid his bill in the end. Well, I, I don't just, think we forgave him because that wasn't our fault. No, I just want to be sure. I want to make sure that the hotel is always making money. And let me tell you, with inflation, <laughs> you might have some opportunity now. Absolutely. We can go back and see if we can grab some of those bucks. I have to go back and see if we have any of that uh, paperwork. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll do that when I get down there uh, next fall. So, um, you know, we talked about the 20s. We talked about the 30s. In the 1940s, the world was kind of focused on uh, World War II. And um, right. the, the hotel's ballrooms hosted a lot of different fundraisers for the, the war effort. Um, what, was, what was that experience like for people, Trevor? Well, it was, it was numerous fundraisers that we had um, for World War II. Um, a lot of organizations of young ladies sponsored uh, dances for the military men in the hotel and our famous grand ballroom. Um, it was it brought a lot of money, of course, for to help um, to help a lot of the soldiers for World War II. Um, interesting enough, though, in in the forties um, and late the late forties and the late fifth and early fifties. This also became a place for a lot of the um, influential people. They chose to to live here in the Georgian Terrace. Right. So there were a lot of um, a lot of the high society here in Atlanta, Georgia, that they um, took up residency here. Yeah, I wonder what that was uh, like. It, it's interesting because. Um most major cities had hotels where it wasn't transient guests. It was people living there for months and months and years at a time. Any uh, sense of what the culture was like during that period when people were living there? Well, you know, actually, I, it was. From what I've read and from what I've heard from this, it became more like a family. Mm -hmm. The ballroom, the our restaurant was a place where you didn't have to sit alone. Uh, these were a lot of the women who... Husbands had been in, in the war, and um, they were by themselves. So they 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 found housing here in um, the fabulous Georgia Terrace um, with lots of people that you know that they had known before, and they just became more of a big family. Yeah. And uh, that's that's so important. And it, it's funny because it's kind of like where we're heading now, where we want everybody to hang out in the lobby and be together. Yep. So uh, all of these new ideas that we have are really uh, old ideas and have been uh, enjoyed at the Georgian Terrace for decades and decades, right? Yeah, they really are. They, um, you know, the interesting thing is when you get down into the 50s and you go even, you know, from the 40s and 50s, you know, like Trevor said, a lot of these uh, – a lot of the, really, there's a lot of women that were staying in the hotel and living here for extended periods of time, people overseas or traveling. And then as the war came to a close um, in the 50s, a lot of people still moved back into the hotel and stayed here, um, still being on the outskirts of town. But the 50s uh, really is when Atlanta started to really come back. Well, not come back, but, I mean, obviously Atlanta right. was burned to the ground during the Civil War, but really started making a resurgence as far as industry is concerned. Um, you know, a lot of banking in the area back in the 50s, and um, uh, Coca-Cola, obviously headquartered here, mm -hmm. Coke really started making its big move really in the 50s and 60s, um, and a lot of those CEOs and a lot of that business came in and out of the property, and the property kind of had a little bit of a resurgence in the 50s and early, you know, through the 50s and early 60s um, as far as being a place to stay, along with the Biltmore that was the other hotel here, which wasn't too far, it was right up the street. Right, and that hotel's no longer there? The Biltmore Building is still here. It's no longer a hotel. Uh, it's owned by Georgia Tech. Uh, Georgia Tech owns the building. They use it for different facilities, mm -hmm. and they actually have a ballroom. They still do weddings and that type of stuff there, but Georgia Tech owns the building. Right. And, of course, you know, by the, uh, the 1970s, the, the world started to uh, change a lot, and there was no difference in Atlanta. And I know a lot of these hotels that were huge in the 20s and 30s and 40s, by the 1970s, they seem to have uh, outlived their useful, use, usefulness. Yeah. And as the city went through changes, especially in uh, Atlanta, where it became a, a, a much more convention-focused city and the needs for the hotel product kind of, uh, kind of changed. What was that era like when, you know, the hotel was getting, you know, on its waning days? Yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, the hotel really had really – Three, I would call it, and I would consider this another heyday. It really had three heydays. You know, obviously when it was first built, um, you know, the 20s, you know, you know, 20, you know, 1911 through like the 19 early 40s, it was really, really a heyday. 
kind of went down after World War II and then really came back strong in the 50s. Uh, 50s and 60s, the hotel did really well. And then uh, really towards the end of the 60s, the civil rights era, Atlanta, you know, that Atlanta was one of the big focuses during the civil rights era. Right. Uh, a lot of people were really afraid to come to Atlanta. A lot of people, um, it, it was just, it, it was a city, of a lot of turmoil. Nothing really violent or anything like that, but a lot of turmoil. Right. And so when it, it, the hotel went through another downturn. And in the 70s, it went through its worst downturn ever. I mean, to be honest, as a hotelier, I mean, I, I love the history. It's great to have, you know, Alex Cooley's Electric Ballroom and the Agora Theater in yep. your hotel, but really, you want a rock and roll band playing in your hotel? I mean, come on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, you know, I mean, they were looking for ways to try and make money to keep the hotel alive. I mean, right. look, I love rock music as much as the next guy and actually a musician, but... You know, you don't play in hotels very often. So that's that's, um, that's so true, Mark. And I'll I'll tell you, it reminds me the scene that I picture. Uh, I feel like it's that uh, that apocalyptic sense. I kind of feel like it's the uh, Terminator coming back and seeing all yeah. the punk rock people in a washed yeah. out building. That kind of world. Exactly what it probably felt like. I mean, the right? hotel was not being very very well taken care of at all. Um, it was dilapidated, and as Trevor had said earlier, we had a lot of. Uh, undesirables and vagrancy going on in Midtown. Midtown was a rough area. Uh, the Fox Theater was struggling uh, and was all just about, they were talking about tearing it down at that point. So it was making, um, it was making this area pretty rough. Yeah. Um, you know, and then there was, and what really brought everything back after that, when the hotel finally closed in 81, shut its doors, the ballroom was still open for three more years and everything closed in 84. Um, the Fox Theater resurgence, as far as Save the Fox effort, is what really brought Midtown, right. really saved Midtown Atlanta and really saved the Fox and really put this back on the fact that we were, along with Saving the Fox, which is also on the National Historic Register of Places in the States, they also tied the Georgian Terrace into that and another building across the street from us, which is the Ponce, apart Ponce, the Ponce Apartment Building on the corner from us. So this little corner is very historic in the area, you know, in, the, uh, in Atlanta. Yeah. Once that happened, uh -huh. um, once the Fox got that wind of everything, investors started putting money back into Midtown back in the really late 80s, early 90s. And a company came and swooped in and bought this property and invested some money into it. And uh, like I said, the rest is really history from that on. And changed hands uh, maybe three times since then. Uh, Southerly is the fourth owner uh, that has had it since 91. And I will tell you, we feel like we're back in our heyday again. I don't know if you know that the hotel just got uh, not, just got ranked by USA Today Travel as top ten hotel in Atlanta, Amazing. top ten luxury hotel in Atlanta. And you've got great properties like the St. Regis, the Mandarin. You know, we're on that list of hotels. So we feel like we're back in our heyday and back in our element. Well, from what I saw, it definitely feels like you're back in your the heyday, back in the element. And as I said at the beginning of this conversation, I feel like it's a very modern stay experience, but has that historical sense about it and almost uh, regal in a way. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it, it's still got, it's got that a little bit of that, uh, you know, the Georgian background, obviously the Georgian Terrace, but you got a little bit of that, uh, of that era's uh, feel to the building from when it was built. You know, I think the people that renovated it and even our owners have added, a, if you look at the rooms, they've added something from every era as far as how they've, put the decor in the rooms. You know, we've got hardwood floors, but all the decor in the rooms has flashbacks to uh, the entertainment industry, which this hotel has been the center of for many, many years. You know, any band that comes into the Fox, and even in the past, you know, Greg Allman stays here quite a bit. You know, anytime he's in town, really? where is the hotel of choice? Yeah, I mean, the guys from REM, I mean, I think we've got those guys coming in in a couple of weeks, Peter Buck and a few other people coming in for a tribute. So, uh, we do a ton with the entertainment and the movie industry. Right. Um, and kind of what the hotel was kind of founded on, if you really go back and look at it, you know, being involved with Gone with the Wind. Right. Uh, and it's always been attached to that somehow, some way. It's great that we've continued that tradition by still having that tie to the entertainment industry. Uh, speaking of REM, do you have room for both Michael Stipe and his beard these days? Probably not, <laughs> because it would probably have to drag behind him for yeah. about six feet. I mean, I got to stay. Somebody that personally comes along with him and carries him. Yeah, but I, mean, I got to stay in a great room. But I'm not even sure there was enough room in uh, in that space that I that I was in to contain that <laughs> thing. Um, but as a musician, it must be really cool for you to be in a place that has such musical history to it, and then to interact with all of these artists in the modern day as well. 
Uh, it's really cool. I can tell you, here's a funny story. Um, I was in a fairly successful rock band back in the early 90s, early and mid-90s. Cool. And uh, our band played at the Fox Theater in 19... Somewhere around... This is a blur. 93, 94. Mm-hmm. Um, and we didn't stay here at the Georgia Terrace, but I remember the hotel back then um, when we did play. So it's kind of interesting that everything kind of comes full circle at some point. What was the name of your band? we got to get a plug out for that. Oh, wow. <laughs> Big Mother Thruster. Big Mother Thruster. I'm not familiar with that. What kind of... What kind uh, of... We, were on, uh, we were on an independent label. Well, not, well, we were on uh, Maverick Records, which was Madonna's yep. label. Her brother ran it, which is part of Warner Brothers. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And we yeah. put one album out. There's not much out there. We kind of we all broke up like in the, you know, the mid late 90s. So Well, that's all right. We're all doing different things now. But it was fun, you know, it was a fun time. Hey, you know, uh I would have loved to have uh, done something like that. I've never, I have zero musical talent, and I always think it's pretty cool. And especially since you got to play at the Fox Theater, and now you're running the hotel that's across the street from that. How heady is that for you? That's so neat. It's just really surreal. I mean, to go from, you know, uh, you know, I grew up in the hotel business. My father was a general manager. He ended up owning his own management company at some point. Um, and you know, as a kid, you go back and you. I really, you know, in the hotel industry, to get anywhere, you have to move. I mean, that's what you do. You know, there's only so many hotels out of town, wherever you are, or city. So make any, excuse me, so to make any moves, my dad had to move quite a bit. So I swore I would never do that to my kids. Well, guess right. what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I did it. So, um, but, you know, it's in, it's in your blood. We really, you know, I really enjoyed my uh, time in the hotel industry. Really, really enjoyed it. It's a passion. Yeah. Really, really love it. So, Once uh, it's in your blood, I don't think right. you can ever get it out of Yeah, I, I agree with that. And Trevor, it must be in uh, your blood, too. Um, when people come to the hotel, how often do you get to share the uh, the stories of the property with them? And if uh, someone wants to come to the hotel after hearing this, how can they uh, you know, find you? Well, as soon as you come up to my desk, I, I kind of take a look in back of me and I kind of explain a little bit about the building, especially uh, in back of my desk. The, this part was the original, which is yep. which was built in 1911, and I think I shared with you that mm-hmm. the room that you stayed in when I was here back in 1999, that was Diana Ross's favorite yes. room, the room that you stayed in. So I remember that we'd have to move the grand piano up into her room uh, as soon as she came. Um, I kind of remember hearing her singing "Stop in the Name of Love" a couple of times passing her room. But um, a lot of stars that I've waited on here were older stars, even like Eartha Kitt when she stayed wow. here. Uh, she stayed here for almost a month uh, training, and um, uh, she was doing a production over at the Fox Theater, which was the Wizard of Oz. And waking her up in the morning uh, just to give her a wake-up call, it's just that catty voice that she would give me that used to scare the <laughs> heck out of me. <laughs> I couldn't get I couldn't get that at any other hotel uh, being on my toes. So uh, I, I I like to think of the, the hotel that I work for, which is one of the best hotels. I was so happy to come back. I just I think that she's such a modern classic. Yes. Um, she's you know she's had her her downfalls a little bit, but she had a little plastic surgery and she's back on track. Right. Well, you know, plastic, uh, plastic surgery is uh, is a good thing, just like the hotels had plenty of plastic surgery over the years to look good. But Trevor, I got to tell you, I'm a little hurt that you didn't come by when I was singing Ain't No Mountain High Enough in the, uh, in the oh. Diana Ross suite over there. <laughs> was that you? Yeah. <laughs> I think I heard something about that. We, were gonna, we thought it was a dying cat. I'm right. not sure what it was. Well, yes, I, you know, no, I do not torture animals. That's just how I sing. So. And we sorry. are pet friendly. That's why we thought it might have been a cat. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Any Anything else that you guys want to add about the, uh, the, the, the past of the Georgian Terrace? You know, the, uh, just the connection here in Atlanta, you know, there's uh, – we get a ton of people just walking through the hotel to really see the history because, you know, we do have pictures of the original property throughout it, right. uh, particularly down near uh, one of, particularly downstairs near our speakeasy. We have a, we've got the original safe that's from 1911 mounted downstairs uh, near my office, which is great. And we actually store stuff in it, believe it or not. Right. Uh, we have the original safe door. Um, and just, you know, the hotel's got so much history and, and really so many, so many ties in the entertainment industry. 
um, you know, we welcome anybody to come by and take a look at that. There's actually a group of uh, people that are really uh, tied to Gone with the Wind. They call them Wendy's. Oh, really? Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, they're called Wendy's, and they they come to this hotel almost every year uh, on the date of the on the date of the release of the movie, and really tour through and walk. They'll have lunch and. Um, we did a tie-in with the Fox Theater last year, was it, the year before, on right. the anniversary, where they did a special showing at the Fox of the movie, and they had a bunch of people in from the Wendy organization over. It was just a lot of fun. We did a big reception where we had people dress up in era gowns and out on the deck and had people serving had people serving hors d'oeuvres dressed like Olivia de Havilland. So it was a lot of fun. That's that's pretty neat. Um, so we've looked at the past. What about the future for the Georgian Terrace? Any uh, any thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, you know, we've you know since our ownership bought the hotel, and I can tell you that Drew, our owner, Drew Sims, who's the president and uh, uh, the president and uh, chief uh, CEO of Southerly. Uh, he has wanted to own this hotel for at least 10 years. He has right. tried to find ways to buy it and, because he felt this epitomized what he thought a hotel should be. Mm-hmm. Um, and finally was able to purchase it back in 14, and they have invested a tremendous amount of money to bring it back to its heyday and then also take it into the future. And the hotel is really set to be, I think, the hotel in Atlanta as it really was back in the, you know, back when it was first built. Right. You know, really back in the 20s and 30s. We're positioned really well to get that done. Um, and with staff, you know, with our, and with our team members such as Trevor and everybody that's involved, there's no reason we can't be there. I mean, our goal is to be the absolute namesake for when people say Atlanta, you know, they're thinking hotels, that we would be the hotel they would think of. Well, I had a, uh, I had an incredible experience myself, and again, I know I said it before. I really love how it really is rooted, not just in a sense of place, but in a sense of time. But makes me feel uh, extremely comfortable as a, a modern traveler. I want to thank you guys for being here. How about throwing out some shameless plugs? How can we find the hotel? How can people stay? Any great deals that you might have? Right now, we actually are. I mean, the summer term to best time as far as if you're going to find any deals that come down. Uh, I think we do a, uh, I know we're doing a stay three, get the last night free right now if you come in. Nice. Um, I know we're running that. That usually runs through the end of July. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, you know, like I said, the summer's really a little bit slower. Um, but there's all we've got. If you go to our website, which is www.thegeorgianterrace.com, uh, you will certainly see everything special. You can book directly through there, and we've got everything available you'd want to see. Great, and uh, thanks for putting in the Georgian Terrace, because I know people Absolutely. might make the mistake and just put in Georgian Terrace. Uh, Trevor, any final words, sir? Um, we're just waiting for you to come back. Come back to visit us here at our modern classic Georgian Terrace Hotel. Uh, we'll, I'll try to get you the same room and <laughs> Well, I don't, I don't expect that. I assume that they're going to be uh, people much more important uh, than me coming there. But Trevor, oh, there's nobody uh, more important. Than you. Come right, on. thanks. Uh, thank oh, you God. for your sweet, sweet <laughs> lies. I'm going to internalize that and pretend you mean it. And thank you guys so much for being here today. I had a great time talking to you, and I hope everyone listening out there had a great time listening to our first foray into hotel history. If you have a hotel that you'd like to learn more about, drop me a line, glenn at rouse.media, or find me on Twitter, Instagram, and all those fun places at Traveling Glenn. Don't forget, I got some G's in there. I got some N's in there. You know how to find me. Make it work. And I want to thank again uh, Trevor and Mark for being here with me today. And we'll see you guys next time. That is, uh, unless I decide to uh, check into the Georgian Terrace Hotel with my giant beard and become a Wendy. Thanks, guys. See you next time. 